we've looked at heating curves. You used those in chem chemistry part one. Um, I just want to show you how they correlate with phase diagrams. If we'll take water again as an example, say we're at standard atmospheric pressure, 760, and it's minus 10 degrees, okay? We're in the solid phase for water. If we raise the temperature, we can increase the temperature by doing what? Adding heat. And so that will raise the temperature. What are we doing on the phase diagram? We're moving from left to right, maintaining a constant pressure. So we move from left to right, and the temperature increases until we meet the fusion curve. So that would be going up this line, adding heat, and raising the temperature of the solid until we reach the fusion curve in the phase diagram in which melting or fusion takes place. So we get to this point and then we melt the ice and turn it into liquid water. So we add heat. During a phase change, there is no temperature increase. All the heat goes into changing the, the phase of the matter. And we're remaining on this line during this process. We're not, we're, we're, we're in equilibrium between the two phases until we've had enough heat to form all liquid. And then we start raising the temperature, maintaining that constant pressure, raising the temperature. And we're moving along this part of the heating curve until we get to the vapor pressure curve in the phase diagram. And that occurs at the boiling point, which is 100 degrees if we're at standard pressure for water. There's the 100 degrees right here. And at that point, we undergo a phase change, no temperature change, just a phase change. That all occurs on the vapor pressure curve line of the phase diagram. And then we have all steam, no liquid left. We start raising the temperature again, and we're moving up this curve. As we add heat, we raise the temperature, and that's reflected on this axis. Here, we're, we're maintaining constant pressure, and the temperature is increasing at this point. So you can do this at other pressures, if you do it at a lower pressure, it'll look the same, but it won't occur, it will not occur at the standard melting point and the standard boiling point. It'll be a non-standard melting and boiling point, but it'll be the same concept. If you also change the pressure during this, that's changing two variables at once and the heating curve will not, uh, it will not look like we normally observe. If you change the pressure as well, if you change the pressure as well, then you're changing two variables during this experiment and you can't really use the standard heating curve in that case. Okay, the fusion line Let's take a look at that. That's the line separating liquid and solid phases. If you're on the line, they're in equilibrium. And I put carbon dioxide and H2O phase diagrams, water and carbon dioxide phase diagrams for comparison. As I mentioned before, the fusion lines, their slope is often exaggerated so that you can see which way the slope is positive or negative and water is rather unique because the slope of water's fusion line is negative not many substances have a negative fusion line in their phase diagram so the fusion line indicates the relative densities of the liquid and solid phases what does that mean 
I often remember it like this. If you were to increase the pressure and cause a phase change, that would be because you crossed the fusion line. If you do that, increase the pressure and cross the fusion line to cause a phase change, what you're doing is changing the phase from the less dense to the more dense. Okay, you put high pressure on a phase and it can collapse into a phase with greater density. That means the mass can be occupying a smaller volume. It will do so in response to that pressure. So carbon dioxide, which is typical of most substances, has a positive slope to its fusion line. If you increase the pressure, you could potentially cross the fusion line and pass from liquid to solid. And that tells us that the solid has a greater density than liquid. If you had liquid CO2 and solid CO2 both present, the solid CO2 would be at the bottom of the liquid because it's more dense. Now, you have, for this phase change to occur in response to pressure, you have to be close to the fusion line in order to cross it. Okay, so. That's something you got to keep in mind. But it's the way I remember it when I'm evaluating which phase is the more dense. I, I think about, oh, if I'm going to cross the line, I'm going from less dense to more dense. Well, for water, with its unusual negative slope to the fusion line, increasing the pr pressure can potentially change solid into liquid forms of water. And this tells us that liquid, <coughs> this tells us that the density of liquid water is greater than solid water, ice. And as you know, if you have a glass of water and there's ice, it floats. Why does water have such an unusual slope to its fusion line? Why is solid water less dense than liquid water? There's another way to ask that. Well, you have to look at the crystalline lattice of solid water, of ice. The water molecules pack in a way that has a lot of empty space. They sort of form these hexagonal arrangements where the water molecules are hydrogen bonding to one another. And there's a lot of empty space between the molecules when they pack like this. If you were to increase the pressure, push down on the ice really hard, you could collapse that structure so that the water molecules are no longer packed like that. Now they're touching one another as they do in a water and they can move about as a liquid. So that is uh, the reason for the solid water being less dense than the liquid water is because of the way the, the crystal is arranged at the molecular level. Let's take a look at some more phase diagrams. The first one I want to show you is carbon. Carbon is a network solid. It is not molecular. The phase diagrams we were looking at before for water and carbon dioxide, those are molecular substances. Carbon is not molecular. Solid carbon, whether it's diamond or graphite, is what we call a network solid. There are no molecules of carbon in graphite or diamond. A diamond, if you will, is one big molecule. All the carbon atoms are bonded covalently to one another in a three-dimensional lattice. And it's a different type of lattice for graphite, but it's the same idea. If you were to heat up carbon, you could liquefy it 
and if you vaporize it, now the particles are truly independent. You've broken all the covalent bonds and they're just independent carbon atoms in the gas phase. So how many solid phases do we see in this diagram? Two, graphite and diamond. So you can have a phase diagram with multiple solid phases. How many triple points do you see in this diagram? There are two. You have one up here, which is a triple point between the liquid phase, diamond, and graphite. And there's another one between liquid, gas, and solid graphite down here. So you can have more than two triple points. If you have liquid versus graphite, liquid carbon versus graphite, which is more dense? Well, again, I always think if I'm close to this line, if I'm on the graphite side and I increase the pressure, I won't cross the line because the slope is positive. If I'm on the liquid side I could, and I do this just right at the right temperature, I could potentially cross the line and make it turn into graphite. So that tells me graphite is more dense. Here is carbon dioxide again. We've already seen this one, but I want to show you that if you go to extreme pressures, very extreme pressures, you can see beyond our typical phase diagram that we've considered so far. And in the previous phase diagrams, we've had solid over here on the left, and as you move to the right, liquid and gas and up in the upper right would be supercritical fluid. But turns out if you keep applying incredibly high pressures, you can form a solid phase from the liquid and even the supercritical fluid. Here is an expanded phase diagram for water. And in addition to our usual phase diagram with the solid, liquid, vapor, and supercritical fluid we have several different several different types of solid ice labeled with roman numerals here so we have solid ice type 8 for instance or 6 and these are all different solid phases just as diamond and graphite are solid phases of carbon. It makes sense that at high pressures you would have more collapsed solid phases if it's cold enough or high pressure enough. You squeeze down on solid ice that's typically low density and you compact it and reform it into a solid of another crystalline structure. You do this with a diamond anvil press. I worked in a research lab and down the hall was one of these diamond anvil presses where phases of water at extreme high pressures and, and low temperatures were studied. So if you happen to have read Kurt Vonnegut, don't worry, ICE-9 is on this phase diagram, but it is not the, the kind in Kurt Vonnegut's novel that uh, was sort of uh, apocalyptic, if you will. If you haven't read it, I won't give it away.